Okay, so here it goes. I start over the, the recording as well. So at the end, everything is fine with you? Yeah? Okay, so we start in one minute. Okay, so, uh, well, welcome back, everyone. So, uh, our next speaker is uh, Adrian Gonzalez Casanova, who will talk to us about the uh, Lambda selection and where to find it. So I guess it's the uh, most backward part of the branching processes forward and backward. So, thanks. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian and Sandra, for this uh, really nice uh, opportunity. I'm super happy to be uh, here. And I will talk about Lambda Selection and Where to Find It, which is a joint work with Maria Emilia Caballero, uh, who is NAM in UNAM, and Jose Luis Perez, who is in CIMAT. So let me start my talk by saying something about duality, which is a technique that I like a lot, in which you have two processes that are related uh, by means of a function. Usually, one studies uh, duality using generator methods. Um, and this is very nice and very powerful uh, theory. And you can learn about this in this very nice uh, review paper by Sabine Jansen and uh, Noemi Kurt. But I want to uh, walk in a direction that I, found, uh, I find uh, more intuitive and it's also uh, very powerful. And to do this, let me start with a, with a model, which is the model zero in population genetics. And it's the Greg Fisher uh, model that it's nothing more and nothing less than a, a random graph in which each vertex uh, represents an individual and it uh, each uh, relation a mother-daughter. So in each generation, a generation is a column, you have a fixed amount of individuals, which is uh, denoted by a big N, and each individual chooses its mother uniformly at random from the previous generation. So with this, um, Easy rules, one can construct an, a bi-infinite uh, random graph. And once you have this, you can uh, embed some processes inside it. The uh, more natural ways to do it are the forward process and the backward process. In the forward process, what we do is just put some colors at a generation that we might choose to be zero. And we let the colors propagate by the natural rule that each individual copies the type of its mother. So for example, this guy will be blue because its mother is blue, and this guy will be red because its mother is red. And we defined a, a simple Markov chain, which is the frequency of blue individuals uh, when we travel in the generations. So if we go one step, we have that five, uh, one half of the population is blue. And if we go further, we see how the population uh, the frequency of blue individuals change. So this process is very simple, but uh, it becomes complicated but quite fast. And if we see it in a right scale, it actually converges to a very uh, nice object, which is the Greg Fisher diffusion. So what we do is simply send the number of individuals per generation to infinity. And we also speed up time by the same factor. And then the frequency process converges to the Greg Fisher diffusion, which is the solution of this stochastic differential equation. There is another natural way to look at uh, processes inside this graph, which is uh, going backward in time. And then we will be interested in, in ancestral relations. So we start with uh, a relation in which every individual is uh, on its own block. And if we move forward, we will put in the same block individuals that are uh, siblings. So what we're going to do somehow is take the equivalent relation of being related by generation G. And uh, an easiest way to think about this, which is highly related, is just count the number of ancestors in each generation. 
So in generation zero, we start with the whole population. So we have four ancestors, and here we have three and three and two and two and one and so on. So this is also a, a nice Markov process. And it turns out that uh, it will converge to something which is central in population genetics, and it's the uh, Kinman coalescent. So the Kinman coalescent uh, is a coalescent. This means that it's a partition valued process. And it's a rather simple one in which the only rule is that each pair of blocks coalesce at rate one. So for example, here, uh, I depict a situation in which these two uh, blocks uh, coalesce here. And this means that the state of the process goes from everybody alone to everybody alone except these two guys. And one continue going up until one finds the common ancestor, everybody in the same block. So uh, the ancestral process uh, that I uh, defined before in the Bright Fisher graph converges in the same scaling as the forward process to the, to the block counting process of the Kinman coalescent. And the block counting process of the Kinman coalescent is a super simple Markov chain in, in which you only go down by one unit of, uh, uh, and this happens at rate n choose two. So we have a forward process that go to an SDE and a backward process that go uh, to a, a Markov chain. And then it's natural to ask the question, what is the relation between the two processes? Because after all, they were constructed using the same graph. So they, they, they might be re, uh, related. And the way I want to explain the relation is uh, based on this paper by Martin Mill. And the technique, it's called uh, sampling duality. The idea is quite simple. So we're going to pose the question, what is the probability that three individuals, for example, are all blue, given that I know the frequency of blue individuals in the previous generation? Well, each individual chooses its parent uniformly at random. So the probability will simply be x to the n. x is the frequency. n is the size of the sample, so x to the 3 uh, in this picture. OK, this is easy. But let's define a function of the frequency of blue individuals and the size of the sample by means that, uh, of this probability. So we say s0 is a function of x and n. That is just the probability that all my individuals in the sample are blue. OK, and then xn is nothing more and nothing less than x to the Well, let's change the, the game slightly and do exactly the same game. But now we, we know the frequency at generation 0, and we have n individuals at generation uh, g plus 1. So my new function fg takes information at time 0 and at sample at uh, time g plus 1. There are actually two ways in which we can calculate uh, SG. And one is simply by following the ancestral process, because in order for all these individuals to be blue, all their ancestors need to be blue. So if I know how many ancestors do these guys have, then I simply can write SG in terms of SC, right? So I have that SG of Xn is nothing more and nothing less than the expectation starting in N of x to the number of ancestors at generation g. Well, what I will do now is exactly the same thing, but in the other direction. So one can propagate the blue color forward in time until generation g. And if you know the frequency of blue individuals in generation g, then each individual chooses its parent uniformly at random from the previous generation. And then I know that the probability that they are all blue is simply xgn uh, to the n. And what I have proved is a duality relation. So the formal way to say this is that uh, the process of, of ancestors and of the frequency are dual with respect to the function S0. And the function S0 is a nice function at x to the n. So basically, uh, what I have proved is that um, the two processes are moment uh, dual. So dual with this particular function. OK. So uh, this is uh, what one proves for finite n. And one can let n go to infinity and obtain that the Greit-Fisher diffusion happens to be also a moment dual to the Kinman coalescent. And this is useful because, well, this is a diffusion. It's not a, a super easy to study. 
at this point it is but well uh, and this is nothing more and nothing less than a markov chain so the idea of duality is that you can somehow relate information of a process that you know uh, to information of, of a process that you don't really know and here we have the moments that basically characterize the distribution of your diffusion uh, and here we have the probability generating function uh, of uh, the number of blocks. So this shows that the two processes are extremely uh, related. There are many examples of, of processes that have a uh, moment duality. Uh, probably the most uh, important uh, one is uh, the lambda coalescence, which is a family of, of uh, coalescence in which several blocks can coalesce at one time. This was discovered uh, three times uh, by Donnelly, Kurtz, uh, Pittman, and, and Sagitov in different publications. And the idea is uh, quite simple. So we can construct a probability space in which uh, the lambda coalescent lives simply by saying, well, you have some lines. And then on top of these lines, you throw Poisson uh, processes, and these Poisson processes decide when an individual wants to reproduce. For example, here, this want to reproduce, and it's uh, asking everybody else if they are going to join the reproduction event or not. And they join with some probability Y, and then they don't participate with probability uh, one minus Y. So what happens is that you just, uh, sorry, so you just connect um, the, the places that decided to participate, and then you can go backwards and count the number of ancestral lines as we did before. And here in this event, well, these two lines are glued to this uh, guy here due to the reproduction event. So you go from five ancestors to only three. Um, they are called uh, lambda uh, coalescence because you can, uh, well, all, all the things that you can decide about this process is what is the distribution of these whites. So what is the distribution of the probability of participating uh, in these events? And the way you decide uh, how to uh, participate is using this, uh, here's a small typo. So you just uh, give yourself a finite measure in zero one, and this measure will give you the side of the reproduction event. And for every finite measure that you give me, I can give you a, a, a lambda coalescence. So this is the one-on-one the -on -one relation that gives the name to the lambda coalescence. Um, one can also go forward in time using exactly the same construction. So if you put colors at some point, you just propagate the colors using the rule that everybody copies the, the color of, of the mother. So at this reproduction event, this uh, line here invades these two. So what will happen is that the color of this line is propagated to uh, this other color scheme. And if you let n go to infinity, where n is the amount of, of lines, the forward process converges to, a, to an SDE. But now this SDE will not be a diffusion, but it will be a jump process that uh, it's sometimes called the, the two types Fleming BO process, or uh, we colloquially call it uh, the lambda frequency process. And uh, one can use the sampling duality argument or the generator argument to prove that the two processes are dual. So the frequency process of the lambda coalescent is dual to the number of lines of the uh, lambda coalescent. There are many examples of uh, things that have uh, duality, and I am a bit biased to mention uh, this one, which is the, the seed bank coalescent, which is uh, uh, another interesting object uh, that was uh, discovered twice uh, by uh, Jochen Blatt, myself, Noemi Kurt, and Maite Wilke Berenger, and independently by Amari Lambert and uh, Shuan Ma. And I put these slides mostly to advertise this recent uh, review in Nature Communications by Lennon, Hollander, Maite Wilke Berenger, and Jochen Blatt, in which you can see uh, well, some cool things about this uh, nice object. And the object is very similar to, uh, to the Kinman coalescent. So you have that, uh, you have partitions and each uh, active uh, pair of blocks coalesce at rate one. 
but you can also have that blocks become uh, dormant. So a red line means that the block is dormant and nobody can uh, interact with a dormant uh, block. So what you have is that the trees become somehow uh, larger. And this guy is dual to a two-dimensional uh, diffusion, which is the seed bank uh, diffusion, in which you see a Greg Fisher component and a component that uh, relates the two coordinates of, of your process. And you have a duality that in this case is, is very helpful because if you have two-dimensional diffusions, you don't have the, the classic failure theory uh, to understand uh, your diffusion, but the duality holds. So there are many, many examples that, of things that have a duality in the, in the language of uh, population genetics. You can have things with random genetic drift, mutation, selection, efficiency, and so on. You can have a very long SD, and this will be uh, dual to processes that uh, coalesce, that have coalesce also as a lambda coalescent, uh, in which you have death, you can have killing, you can have branching and you can have a pairwise branch right? and you can have even more cells. Okay, so we arrive to the second part of the talk, which is uh, selection. So what does selection uh, means? Um, there are a lot of things of ways to, to interpret selection. We just think of, of real competing populations and one is uh, prompt to invade the whole population while the other is uh, less likely to, to be successful. And this is related to the reproduction uh, mechanism of, of animals or of whatever life think. So for example, one can think of a cartoon of a bird that reproduces and it produces three eggs, but then the snake can come and eat the eggs or with some probability, uh, the eggs go through and, and uh, form uh, well, new birds. Right? And then you can think selective advantage at some other uh, bird that doesn't produce a tree, uh, X, but it's producing four, so for sure it will tend to have more uh, individuals. But it could also be that there is another bird that produces small eggs, and then they are less likely to be found by the snake, and this again leads to selection for, for the bluebird. So all this selection can be described as Malthusian selection because the average number of offsprings of these two uh, cases are more than the average number of cases of offsprings of the first case. And Malthusian selection is classically studied using uh, the ancestral selection uh, graph in which you have uh, reproduction arrows. So you have these black arrows that mean that this guy reproduces. And you also have selective arrows that are the red ones. And the red arrows can only be used by red birds. So for example, these guys start uh, propagating its color and it arrives here and it wants to propagate the color down here, but it can because it's purple. But this one here arrives to the, to the red arrow and it can propagate uh, its color. So if you let n go to infinity, you also have that this guy converge and it converges to the great Fisher diffusion with selection. So you see the great Fisher term here, and uh, there is an extra term that it's pushing in favor of one of the two uh, types. Um, there is a very, very nice paper by uh, Tora Newhauser that tells how to read this uh, picture backwards. And the idea is, uh, is very nice. So you start with this individual and you want to decide um, whether it's uh, red or purple, but the thing is you don't know the coloring here. So this is, this is hidden information. So what you do is you start following uh, the line backwards, and then you don't know if the ancestor sitting here is red or is purple. So you don't know if you are allowed to use this line or not. So the trick of uh, Krona Newhauser is just branch and follow both uh, possibilities. And why do, do, uh, is this uh, a good trick? Well, because in order for this guy to be purple, it is necessary that both these points are purple. If this guy is red, it will manage to use the red line and go all the way here. And if this guy is red, it will just walk and arrive to the other uh, line. So in order for this guy to be purple, both birds here need to be purple. 
And this is the key trick to, to construct a sampling duality argument that controls, uh, that relates forward and backward pictures. But there is more kinds of um, selection that one can consider. For example, the purple bear might compete with a pink bird. And the pink bird uh, has a different strategy, which is it produces three eggs, but each of the eggs is put in a, in a different nest. So each of them will be found by, by the snake uh, independently. So each of them is found with probability one third, but uh, it can be that the three are found, or maybe it's just one, or maybe two of them, uh, or maybe all of them uh, survive, right? So obviously the expectation of the two mechanisms is exactly the same. Um, so the question is, is there one that would, should have selective advantage over uh, the other? Uh, well, they are not the same strategies because we can see that the pink bird has less variance than the, than the purple bird. And actually this whole cartoon of the birds is based on the introduction of this uh, nice paper by, by Gillespie in which he actually claims that variance is also under selective pressure. So nature wants to reduce the variance of the uh, reproduction mechanisms and not only increase the expectation. And this is a very, very cool observation, but for us, it's even nicer, the technique that Gillespie used to prove this uh, observation. And the technique is based on, on, on branching processes, in particular on failure processes. So we have a failure process that is simply the solution of, of this SD. This part is the deterministic part, which is for a, for a biological interpretation, uh, the Malthusian, so the expectation of the offspring individuals. And this guy will uh, talk about uh, the, the variance. And then he proposed to study, so, so he takes two independent failure processes like this, uh, where B1 and B2 are not necessarily the same, and C1 and C2 are not necessarily the same. And then he defined the processes set T, which is the total mass, which is the sum of the two, and RT, which is the frequency of type one. So it's type one divided by the total uh, mass. And then it comes the great idea of, of Gillespie, which is uh, Gillespie's cooling, uh, in which what he's doing is he let the two processes, the two failure processes evolve independently for, for some time. And then at some times that we call sampling times, the population is reduced to the starting population size in such a way that the frequency of blue and red individuals is preserved before and after the sampling event. And this is uh, done again and again and again. So here you restart the red and the blue failure processes, and then you uh, sample again, and you repeat and repeat and repeat. And this is uh, something uh, that looks similar to something that we like a lot, which is what is happening in the Lensky experiment. So in the Lensky experiment, the Lensky experiment is a very, very fascinating experiment uh, that is done in, in, in Michigan by Richard Lensky and uh, his friends. And the idea is quite simple. So he put bacteria on a, on a flask, let the bacteria grow, then sample the bacteria, put in a, in a new flask, identical to the, the one of the day before, and let the bacteria grow. And he had been doing this for uh, 30, 30 years, basically. So he, he can freeze the bacteria, so he have basically a picture of the evolution of bacteria during these uh, 30, 30 years. And it's something that we have uh, been thinking about uh, from a prob probabilistic per perspective. Uh, so if this is interesting for you, you can uh, take a look of, of one of these two uh, reference. The, the Lensky model is what is uh, drawn uh, in my blackboard. Uh, but I just want to say now that it's reminiscence of this idea of, of, of Gillespie of uh, growing the population and sampling, growing the population and sampling, only that here is in a uh, Galton Watson setting, and we are now thinking in branching uh, processes. So what he, he do is he continue doing this uh, independent branching, independent, uh, sorry, independent sampling, independent sampling. And what he will do later is make the sampling times go to, to zero. 
So let's take a look at what happened uh, if the sampling times are the, the integer numbers. So he started with uh, two populations, they grow until time one. And then on time one, he would just cut the, uh, the population such that you start with uh, branching processes, but only from the remaining uh, part of the population. And then set uh, one G, so for every sampling time, G is the sampling time, the total mass will be fixed, will be set, because you artificially bring it back to set, but the frequency of blue individuals will change and it will change in a Markovian way. So if we look what is the frequency at generation, uh, at sampling time one, then, well, you just uh, take the relative frequency of blue and, and red uh, individuals, you um, put this uh, here in the bottom, and in the, top, in the top, you put the, 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 the blue part, part on. Right? This will give you a, a nice um, Markov, Markov chain. So the result is that if you let the sampling time go to zero, so you are sampling very, very frequently, and you accelerate time uh, by, by n as well, then there is convergence to this diffusion that uh, we call the, the guide fisher gillespie diffusion. And if you look carefully at it, it's very, very similar to the uh, Greit Fisher uh, diffusion, but it has this very nice term here, which is speaking about the difference of the variance. So it will really help the person who has uh, less variance. And it also has this uh, population dependent uh, random genetic drift uh, factor appearing here. But if you take C, uh, one equal to C2, then you recover the classic Greit uh, Fisher uh, diffusion. Okay, so now let's uh, go from branching process to, to, to coalescence. Branching process and coalescence are the most important, I think, processes related to biological questions, uh, probabilistic processes related to biological questions. So it's very natural to wonder what is the relation between these two families of, of process. And this is a very classic uh, question in which many uh, important authors have, have work. There is a lot of literature. So I chose only to, to mention uh, two papers which have inside a big part of the history of the, of the field. Um, so let me just write here what is a, a continuous state branching process is the solution of this uh, SDE. It's characterized by a deterministic part and a, a variance part, a, a Brownian part. If you only say see this, what you have is a failure process as before. And uh, it also has this part here, which is related to a Levy measure M, and it gives the, the jumps of the process. And one can also put uh, a subordinator that would indicate uh, migration. <clears throat> So if you haven't seen these things before, it's just a process that has the branching property and moves in continuous uh, space. So the first uh, paper I want to mention is uh, uh, the, the seven author uh, paper by uh, Birkner, Blatt, uh, Capaldo, Etheridge, Moll, Schreiber, and Bakobinger, which is really a, a classic in the field. And it, uh, merged, it was uh, born uh, by the merge of different groups thinking on the question of how to relate uh, branching processes with, uh, with coalescence. And well, it's the end of a sequence of, of important uh, findings. And it's, it's about relating branching processes and coalescence via time change using the total mass. So what they do is they take an alpha stable uh, branching process, they construct the R process and the set process as before, so set is the total mass and R is the, the frequency. And they show that uh, if, you, if you define this time change uh, process like, like this, then Ys is nothing more, nothing less than uh, the moment dual of a two minus alpha, uh, well, uh, of a beta coalescent with beta H equal to two minus alpha. And it's the end of the story of this very, very strong uh, relations between coalescence and branching process because they also prove that this is an if and a leaf. 
So the only ways that you have such a strong relation is that you start with alpha stable uh, processes. There is another family of, of, of nice papers which uh, try to couple, at least at a small time, uh, coalescence with uh, branching uh, processes. And the most recent um, uh, publication in this direction is by Samuel uh, Justin and Mary Lambert. And they managed to prove a small time coupling basically between every uh, Levy measure and uh, a lambda uh, coalescent by uh, introducing this uh, function that goes from, from Levy uh, to lambda and it's, uh, it's written here. So it's, it's relating the, the branching process or the genealogy of the branching process at a very small time with lambda uh, coalescent. And here it's important that it's at a very small time because it's known that by the fluctuations of the size of the branching process, you would lose the, um, the Markov property of your quads. So now uh, I will start talking about some of our results. So what we want to do is to take the idea of Gillespie, but now we will consider instead of failure processes, a completely general continuous state branching processes and also allow uh, integration. So we take our two favorite independent processes, we consider the total mass, we consider the frequency, and uh, we use the, the Gillespie trick. We also formalize uh, the Gillespie trick a bit, and where well, we prove convergence to, uh, to a SD. And here I'm being a bit simple-minded because the most difficult part of the paper is to show that this uh, SD uh, has a unique uh, strong solution uh, and so on. So once you do this, um, you can take uh, special cases. So if the two continuous state branching processes are equal in distribution and there is no uh, immigration, what you get is a, is a lambda class. So by the Gillespie technique, we have constructed a new, a new bridge between uh, branching processes and coalescent uh, processes. So this is a bit more detail of, of this uh, statement. So you see how the, the, the branching mechanism is sent into the, the lambda mechanism and it's using basically the same, um, the same function as in the Justin Lambert uh, case. But now we have really a, a function that goes from, uh, from process to process and not a small time uh, copy. And we also have a, a, a theorem that tells us that the lambda uh, coalescent space, so the space of, of lambda coalescence with a, with a metric given by a weak convergence is homeomorphic to the space of uh, branching processes, so continuous state branching processes, in which you just identify two mechanisms that have the same uh, deterministic uh, part. So basically we show that this function that goes from uh, branching processes to coalescence happens to be an homeomorphism. But what we were uh, more interested in the, in the beginning is what happened if you take two completely different um, continuous state branching processes and you play this, this game. And what happened is, well, basically you can find everything that, that we thought we could find. So you can have random genetic drift, you have these things that are reminiscent of the gillespie greg fisher equation, you have some jump terms, you have um, mutation in both directions, you have selection, and you have more jump terms. And here I just write jump terms because they are, well, these jump terms we didn't see that they were common. So we have some pairwise branching, and we also have some mysterious k-tuple branching uh, appearing here, and in the other side, we have some jump terms that are related to nonlinear non branching. So in the last part of my talk, I will explain where this nonlinear branching is coming from. And this k-tuple branching is a bit uh, mysterious still at the beginning. But before we go to this nonlinear branching, that is what we call uh, a lambda selection, let me just say that we have uh, recently put another paper in our archive where we do similar things, but in, in, in two dimensions. So we have uh, failure processes this time, and you take uh, 
multi-type failure processes, you do the Gillespie trick and you find uh, a nice limit. And one can have many things, including uh, something uh, that goes to the uh, seed bank diffusion, which is dual to the, to the seed bank uh, coalescence. So let me go to the, to the lambda selection uh, part. Uh, basically what we want to do is to see what happens if you put two lambda mechanisms that are not the same to compete one uh, against the other. So what do I mean? So imagine that you have two types of individuals, the blue and the red, and then uh, when the blue individual reproduces, everybody uh, decides to participate in the event with probability Y. Um, but, uh, well, and, and if it uh, happened, it puts its type in the lines that it, it made. <clears throat> but the, there is a red individual, and the red individual is uh, doing lambda events that are typically bigger. So in a, in a red reproduction event, each individual decides to participate with probability y plus z, right? So this is why we call it lambda selection because there are lambda mechanisms in which one is clearly uh, better than, than the other. So for sure, the red individuals will have a tendency to, to win. One can uh, relatively easily show uh, the convergence of the forward process to something that looks like the forward process of the uh, of the typical lambda coalescence, only that here you have uh, y plus z, and here you have a y. This is for fixed y uh, and z. <clears throat> and this is uh, related, so we are not the first to, to think of asymmetric lambda processes. So there is a very nice paper by Etheridge, Griffiths, and, and, and Taylor, where they take a special uh, case of of lambda selection, and they prove something that uh, I, I define what I call stationary duality. I don't know if they will be happy with this uh, name, but they use the stationary uh, uh, distribution to construct a duality structure between lambdas uh, forward and backward, so asymmetric lambdas. And what we do somehow generalize uh, the results because we are able to do more general, all lambdas basically. Uh, but it's uh, less extensive because we, we only do uh, two types. So what we want to do is basically use sampling duality. Uh, so sampling duality is my, my favorite thing to do. So the first thing that we need to do is to control the probability space in which we can travel forward uh, and backwards. And this is done by uh, consider a process in which you have lines and you have events and each line decide to participate or not in the event. But now we have three possibilities. So you can say, I will participate in the event, no matter what. And this is with probability Y. You can say, I will not participate in the event, no matter what. And this is with probability one minus Y minus Z. And you can also say, I will participate in the event only if the guy reproducing is of the advantageous type. So these are reminiscence of the selective lines of Cron uh, uh, and Newhouse. So if you, if you use this probability space, you can travel forward in time. And what you will have is exactly the same forward process of, of asymmetric lambdas that uh, I described before. But what is nice is that you can also travel backwards. So if you want to decide what is the type of this individual, you just use the, the trick that Cron and Newhouse told us, and at this, a red point, you need to follow this line and follow this line to decide what is the type of this individual. So, so far, so good. But uh, so yes, so if this guy will be of the weak type, if and only if these two guys are of the, of the weak type. So we see a, 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 branching, a branching event also here. But why is this very different from the Cronin Newhouser story? Because if you see a bigger sample, so if you see these three lines and you follow them all the way to the reproduction event, what happens is that these two guys coalesce and go to this point here. And this guy has jumped here and it also had continued. 
But you see that the branching event is hidden by the coalescent event of these two individuals. So if you count the number of lines, the branching event is not present in so what you get is something that coalesce following the rules of a lambda coalescent, because for example, in this case, you saw only a coalescent event, and it will branch only if at least one individual decides to follow a red line and nobody decides to follow a, a black line. So one minus y to the end is nobody use a black line, and you need to subtract it to say at least one individual took a red, uh, a red line. And this is very cool because it's playing these mysterious um, uh, nonlinear branching that appear uh, algebraic, uh, algebraically before. So what we are trying to, to finish, but uh, well, we know what is true, we, we need to prove it. Uh, Still, but the, the, the theorem is that we, we do not need to fix y and z as in the pictures, but we can take random uh, y and z as in the lambda story. And the restriction is that you need a singularity of order two for the coalescent part, uh, and you need a singularity of order one for the nonlinear uh, branching part. And if you have these two conditions, the ancestral process uh, is uh, well defined and the dual exist as the solution of uh, an SDE. I just write here the SDE for, for someone, uh, if someone wants to take a look later. But the point is that if you have this uh, condition, you know that this guy exists and the forward and backward process will be a uh, moment dual. So we arrive to the last part of the talk. What, uh, what about this uh, lambda selection? So do one expect to see it uh, in nature, or it's a very mathematical way of uh, selection that is just nice, right? Which would be also something nice, but the conjecture is that uh, this kind of, of selection should occur uh, in nature, and one place where it can occur is uh, in the Lensky experiment. So why do I uh, think this is the case? Well, in the Lensky experiment, remember I told you that what people do in the lab is they put bacteria in the fresh medium, then the bacteria start reproducing, and then it's sampled and put uh, in, in the same medium. But what I didn't say before is that when the bacteria is put in the fresh medium, it does not start to reproduce uh, immediately. So there is something that is called the lag phase, uh, which is the time that the bacteria uh, takes uh, before it starts reproducing. And the lag phase is important uh, biologically because uh, it saves the bacteria from starting reproducing uh, and then the weather changes, for example, and everybody dies, right? So it's some sort of a prevention against uh, uh, change uh, of the environment. But in the Lensky experiment, there's always the same environment and it's always a good environment. So there is a strong pressure for the bacteria to wake up earlier and earlier and earlier. And if you see, if you wake up earlier, you start reproducing before, and this gives you a lot of advantage. So what we have proved, together with Fernando Cordero, Jason Schweinberg, and Maite Wilke Berenger, is that uh, this randomness in the, uh, in the lag phase lead to lambda coalescence. So if you take, uh, so well, the, the, the paper contains more, but if you take a similar uh, model uh, to the Lensky uh, experiment, you see that the randomness in the lag phase produces a uh, convergence to, to, to an ancestry that is uh, given by a particular case of, of, of a lambda. But what happens if some type of individuals is prone to wake up before the others? So some type of individual gets a mutation that will make them tend to wake up before. What you will see is selection, and this selection is uh, in, the, in the regime of the, of the lambda world. So what we expect is uh, that here one would see a lambda selection in the reality. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. So uh, we have 
We can start for, uh, with a round of applause first. So. And uh, we have time for, for some questions. So again, if anyone wants to ask uh, questions in the chat or raise their hand, oh, Sebastian, okay. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for your talk. Uh, I have one question about uh, what you just uh, instantly said. <laughs> um, so about this uh, conjecture about finding uh, the process in nature and so on, do you, I mean, is there like, yeah, are there some uh, testable statements like uh, we make an experiment and uh, if we observe this, then it is a confirmation. If we observe this, it is, it is, inf uh, it is disconfirmed. Uh, like, uh, is this, um, yeah, is this conjecture like uh, really testable by experiments or is it more uh, philosophical level? Yeah, no, very, very cool question. So it's, um, if, if we were 30 years ago, I would be very fast to say it's just a you know, theoretical uh, level. But the thing is that uh, by now, uh, people in the Lensky lab or the Desai lab or uh, many experiments are tracked uh, almost uh, live. So you see, the frequency of, of these individuals, how it changes, how it goes down, how so they can really track uh, the trajectories of, of frequencies of, of types. And there is a very uh, recent and important story that uh, this whole machinery of the lambda coalescent was constructed. I don't know if it's uh, so, so. It was thought that it lived in, in the nature, but I think that it was mostly important because mathematically it's, it's extremely beautiful. And in, in recent years, there was uh, works by, uh, by physicists, uh, an amazing work by, by Jason Schweinberg, uh, where uh, it's shown that selection uh, lead to the Waldhausen uh, Schmidtman uh, coalescent. And this can be seen basically in the, so one of the, Theoreticians or, or, or the more physicists that said that this should be the case, if I remember correctly, is, is Desai, and he has this paper of uh, with, he has this experiment with GIST in which one can actually see the Bolhaus and uh, Schwindman coalescent uh, there, right? So it uh, looks like a simulation somehow. So uh, this is a very fresh idea, and I, I don't claim that it's in the so, so the, the discovery of, of the relation of the Volkhaus and Schmidman coalescent with selection is super huge and this is much more modest, but for sure one could uh, dream of seeing this uh, in, in a real space. Okay, thanks a lot for the answer and for your talk. <laughs> so are there some more questions? I have one. Maybe can you speak more about the uh, branching events that are uh, generalized branching events? I don't know how you call them. Ah, uh, uh, well, <laughs> so uh, yes. So maybe so more precisely, uh, do you know the function that it is behind? Because so normally... we have it uh, written explicitly in this in this paper. Yeah. Uh, I will certainly uh, send it uh, to you. But this reminds me that I forgot to mention uh, that this uh, gillespie grad fisher diffusion uh, story was studied by, by Lambert in, in 2006. And together with uh, uh, Juan Carlos uh, Pardo, Jose Luis Perez, and uh, Veronica Miropina, Juan Carlos Pardo, we, we look at the duality of, of this, this guy here. And what occurred was that there is this very mysterious, in some sense, uh, pairwise branching occurring. So you can algebraically find that the dual has this pairwise branching, but it remains a big mystery for me uh, is if there is a, a, a almost pure construction that one can build to see this pairwise uh, relation uh, occur. And now uh, with this general branching story that you take and you 
produce uh, algebraic a dual, you see that it's even worse, right? So it's not, uh, pairwise is not special, but there are branchings of, of every type. So I, I can only say that I'm more, more puzzled than before, but, <laughs> and I will send you the, 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 the precise form of the, of the theory. And maybe another question, if you have different types, so here it is because you only have two types, right? And you have the C1 and C2. Mm -hmm. So if you have different types, you expect to have like, a, I don't know, a linear composition there or... So instead of having C2 RT plus C1, one minus RT, right. do you have like... A, I really like this kind of questions for you already saying me the answer because I, I didn't thought about this before, but for sure this, this has to be the case, right? So the and, and you also have that there should be a so the Brownian motions will now be playing with, with each other like in a usual great fisher multi-type great fisher diffusion, but indeed I would guess exactly what you say that there is a C1 plus C2 plus C3, blah blah blah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, we didn't say uh, something about this. That's very nice. Thanks. So, are there additional questions? Uh, well, so, so if I if I may uh, as well, so you you introduced a, a lot of uh, duality results. And uh, every time you have a duality, you also uh, produce like uh, an exact coupling, right, between the two. Where you can you can construct the two processes on the same state space. I, is it always the case, or is it just the class of models you? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a that's a great question, and thank you for uh, for for saying this. So uh, every time that you can prove the duality using the sampling duality trick that I explained, this is actually called Padwise duality because it's more than the classic uh, duality of expectations. So it's really a duality of events somehow. Okay. And algebraically, you what you can prove is really the duality of the expectations, uh, but they can live in, in very different uh, places, and it's really a finite dimensional distribution story. Okay. And for example, in this case of the of this uh, paper that we prove duality uh, with a process that has pairwise branching uh, is no, it's not that we think that it's very hard to, to have the pathwise dualities. I mean, I'm not even sure if it's possible, right? So, uh, okay. so it, it could be that, I don't know, uh, could be that there are examples in which you can have weak duality, but not pathwise duality. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. So, are there some more questions? Otherwise, let's. Uh, well, thanks again, both speakers, for very nice talks, and uh, thank you all for for coming. And uh, so, well, I am going to stop now the the live stream. As well as the um, as well as, as the recording. <laughs>